right, okay, so this is the last contentful lecture that I'm going to give this semester. Everything else is going to be contentful, no lack, but given by you guys. So hopefully that will turn out well. Anyway, <laughs> I had full confidence. <laughs> All right, so today what I want to do is I want to end with something that looks a bit to the future of this. This has been uh, a subject we started out essentially in the 19, early 1900s and pushed all the way up until the present, or just a few years back from the present, now we're going to get right into the present, uh, and talk a little bit about some active areas of research. Um, and in particular, what I'm going to talk today about is, well, chief cohomology. Now, chief cohomology is not new by any means. Uh, but, but some of the applications of it are. So. Our new uh, the theory goes back to 1945 or thereabouts. Right about when topology was being sort of the hotbed of initial thoughts in topology. And as the story goes, uh, 1945 was a particularly interesting set of years around then. What was happening then? World War II. Yeah, in World War II and thereabouts. Yeah. Um, so, sheave cohomology was put together during World War II. As the story goes, it was put together by Jean Moray, a French mathematician, um, who had actually been captured by the Nazis. And he was a, an applied mathematician, apparently working in fluid dynamics, and was very concerned about the fact that he knew a lot of things that could be useful to the Nazis. And as a means of keeping these ideas out of the hands of the Nazis, although he was in a concentration camp, uh, and the Nazis knew he was a mathematician, he started teaching this stuff with the idea that it would be completely inapplicable to anything mm. <laughs> and would therefore be left alone by the Nazis. And then after the war ended and published his findings. Um, I find it a little bit amusing now that, that in fact we have some new applications. And part of that comes about from this combinatorial topological viewpoint that we've been looking at thus far in this course. Um, so much of the old theory is built on general topological spaces. The fundamental unit here is points and open sets. Now, the problem with that is, as any student of point set topology will surely recall, and if you've not actually taken the subject, is that there are a lot of pathological things. There's a lot of bad, badly behaved topological spaces out there. There are sets that are that have open sets that are also closed. There are strange kinds of disconnected spaces. There are strange, all sorts of weird things that go wrong. And all of these bad properties lead to bizarre sheaths that are hard to compute with. Now, when applications, by which we mean applications to other fields of mathematics of sheaf theory came about, those were viewed actually as being useful because people were studying algebraic geometry, which is the study of curves and surfaces defined by algebraic equations. Turns out you need that kind of structure because bad things can happen there. On the other hand, from a practical setting, that doesn't work so well. So, much of this sat dormant until around the 70s or so. So, so our viewpoint that I'm going to put in this particular lecture uh, goes back to around 1975. Um, following. Though 
the particular viewpoint that I'm going to push here about the use of these particular mathematical objects is much, much more modern, as in past two years ago, and including some preprints that are now just a few days old that I put up on, on the archive. So the, this, these general topological spaces tend to crop up in differential topology? No, no, no. Differential topology involves manifolds, and they're very highly constructed. No. No. So, yeah, in fact, that's the way I, look. I learned chief theory myself on differential topological spaces, on complex manifolds. Um, still highly constructed. A lot more complexity is present in a general topological space. Okay, so let me cut right to the chase. And, and rather than digging into the open sets extensively, I'm going to show you how they work on our favorite kind of space, the simplicial complex. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build sheaves of vector spaces on simplicial complexes. I'm going to give you some interpretation for what that means. Too. So. Sheaves of vector spaces on abstract simplicial complexes. It's important to realize that sheaths take two inputs, two type inputs. A type of a space that they are of and a type of a space they are on. The, proposition, uh, the prepositions are useful to distinguish these two because they play very different roles. If you, usually people like to think of this as the horizontal part, and this is the vertical part. The horizontal part is topological. Vertical part is algebraic. So there are sheaves of rings on manifolds. There are sheaves of fields. There are sheaves of various other kinds of algebraic structures on plenty of other kinds of topological spaces. Now, What's a what is a sheaf in English grammar? In, in English language, what is a sheaf? Something you used to cut wool off. Of More like a, that's a shear. <laughs> shear, sheaf. Yes. Uh, it's like a, a great big parcel of grain. Yeah, a great big parcel of grain. Yeah. That, you can shear a sheaf, yes, but. I learned. <laughs> I tried to play off the joke. <laughs> not, not, not doing very well. Anyway, so here, here, here's a here's a little piece of grain. There's another piece of grain. A bunch of different types of bits of grain. Put together, and the thing that you do with this is you bundle it up. And the colors match the colors here. But there is a sort of a horizontal bundling thing, and there is a vertical algebraic thing. So the mental picture is literally a sheaf of wheat, where the vertical, each of the various plants, are where you're going to do the, you're going to do the algebra within each plant. And amongst the plants, across the plants, is where you're going to do topology. That's a pretty good drawing. Thank you. All right. Now, let's take the agricultural reference a little bit further. <laughs> One of these individual grain things is a stalk of wheat. So there's this notion of grabbing out a single algebraic space that you're going to study at any given time. That's a stalk. Or you might study them all together. Now, there's an additional term, and I'm out of nice colors, would have liked to have blue, but I black. 
which if I take a whole bunch of these stalks and they're grabbed together in a bundle like this, in a sheaf, in a sheaf exactly. <clears throat> and one thing I might do is I might ask, well, here's a particular spot in this stalk. And that particular spot is next to an analogous spot in this other stalk. And that is next to analogous another one and another one and another one. So if you will, this whole selection, this slice of all of these stalks together, it's kind of like a cross-section of this sheaf of wheat. This is a cross-sectional cut of this sheaf of wheat, of this bundle. Now, as it turns out, what's important in the theory of sheaves is not just the algebra, the stalks. It's not just the topology, the horizontal portion, the, the bundle holding it together, a piece of, maybe a piece of rope holding it together. What's also important is the sections, the cross-sections cutting across everything, telling you what's, what's next to what, next to what, next to what, next to what. So that's the... the high-level cartoonish picture of what sheaves are. Now what I want to do is I want to actually show you what they, how they work physically on abstract simplicial complexes when the algebraic data type, the stalks, are vector spaces. Keep this picture in your mind. This particular kind of sheaf that in which the, the horizontal part, or the base space, this is called the base space. The case where that is a, is a CW complex, at the very least, is called a cellular sheaf. Cellular sheaves really, I think the original definition that I remember seeing written down, uh, tracing our topology class, very nice. I told them they were being loud. Uh, okay, got it. That's why. Okay, so now you're coming back and you've got a coefficient of one on that, on that class. Excellent. Okay, very Does well. Does that just mean that he ended up where he started? Yeah, well, he looped around and it's non contractible loop. Uh, well, it's non contractible. Well, because I don't think he passed through the wall. Well, he says you. Uh, don't think. Don't think. <laughs> You run really fast, Chris. You wind up at Hogwarts. That's right. <laughs> and if you put enough energy in it, <laughs> electron tunneling is your friend. OK. Um, right. So let me show you. Let's take a look at what an abstract simplicial complex looks like and how we can bundle some stocks over it. So if I have an abstract simplicial complex, let's pick this one. This is filled in. Four vertices A, B, C, and D. So it's my abstract simplicial complex. Now, what are the other simplices? Well, I've, I've sort of drawn them graphically. There's A, B, there's A, D, there's B, D, B, C, and C, D, and then there's also A, B, D in addition to the obvious A, B, C, and D individually. That's the abstract simple complex that I've drawn. Now, if you write these down as if they are the sets in the abstract simplicial complex, they kind of fit together. Some of these are subsets of the other. See, the, the A subset of my vertex set and the B vertex set, both of them are subsets of the A, B set. They're both subsets. And I can draw an arrow saying that I'm, I can write a function taking each element over here, into, well, there's only one of them, into elements over here. And similarly down here, here's my D, and here's my A, D, and here's my uh, B, D. And the one right in the middle, A, B, and D together, well, each of these guys are subsets of them. Now, of course, it's also the case 
that A is a subset, and D is also a subset of this three element set. Now, function composition is transitive. If I compose two functions, I get a new function from the very first one to the very last one. Uh, and this is a commutative diagram, actually, as far as functions go. A goes to A, which goes to A. A goes to A, which also goes to A. The same A in either case. So we really don't have to show this, just assert this is a commutative diagram. Great. All right, so let me not write quite as many arrows to clutter up the mess here. Okay, but I'm not done, because I also have C. It's not that bad. This thing can get a lot, get a lot worse. So A just to be just arrows imply subsetting. Yep. Uh, and is each of these each of these guys, each of these lists is going to be a vector space? Well, so thus far, all I've done is I've taken the the information involved in specifying an abstract simplicial complex. And I've just written it out in terms of subset relations, diagrammed it. Mm -hmm. I can diagram this in a little bit different way. It's a little uh, a little more regular of a structure, although a little messier of a diagram, where I can put the vertices on the bottom, and then the edges, and then the two syntheses, etc., and just go up the whole way through. Mm -hmm. That would be a partial order. This is also a diagram of a partial order. I can tell you which of these are smaller. Sometimes I can tell you which is smaller than the other, but not always. I can't tell you whether A or B is smaller. They're kind of on the same level. But I can definitely say that A is smaller than A, for instance. So that's a, an abstract simplicial complex, sort of visualized as, a, as an arrow with a diagram. If there's, if there's a trail between any two vertices, yep. there's a partial order in between them. There, then there's an order in between them. Yep. One is less than the other, exactly. OK, now, Dave is exactly right. This is, this is purely on the level of topology. This is the red, the horizontal thing. Now we want to vertically push things out of the board. And the way to do that is to say that I've got some data on C that now stretches out of the board. Some data on this edge, which stretches out of the board. Some data here, which stretches out of the board. So if I'm making a sheaf of vector spaces, they all ought to be vector spaces. So, all right. So what this means is I should have a vector space on A, or perhaps now, here's where I'm going to get fun with the fonts. Uh, let, me make, let me call my sheaf, let me name it script S. So I've got a script S on A, script S on D. Each one of these are vector spaces. And I'm going to I really have to put in all these silly brackets, aren't I? But I'm going I'm to be lazy. I'm going to just call this A, B. Call this one AD because I don't want to write all parentheses. All the square brackets and what have you, commas, they're all in there, but I'm just doing it right So there are sheets? I'm not done yet. Getting close. Okay. Getting close. But follow the arrows just as before. Each of these are vector spaces. So each, each S sigma for a simplex is a vector space. Now, I've got all these vector spaces floating around. What should those arrows be? They were functions. Or what should they be now? Yeah. Linear maps. They should be linear maps, yes. Each arrow, which is linear, such that, what do you think is going to happen? The diagram. The diagram commutes. Yeah, this particular object that we've now built. This particular object, it's got vector spaces now everywhere. There's some kind of relations amongst who's nearby who turns into how to translate from one to the next. OK? 
Okay, so now sticking with my same color coding here, this thing is a stock. The diagram amongst here that describes the topology describes the base phase. This thing here so the base phase is telling me sort of the, the connectivity structure, who's who's nearby who. The stalks that are each of these individual vector spaces, such as the design of the commutes. That's a specification of a sheaf. Now I am making a simplification here. If you go dig into the traditional sheaf literature, they will tell you this object that we've defined is a pre-sheaf, not a sheaf. And then there's this long discussion about what makes a pre-sheaf into a sheaf. The difference between sheaf and pre-sheaf is actually kind of silly. That's why I don't distinguish it in this particular context, uh, because every pre-sheaf can be uniquely sheafified. So, eh, why bother? All right. So, this is an aside. I'd say I'm cautioned. Why bother distinguishing between them? So if I give you a pre-sheaf as this is, you can just imagine the thing is sheafified in the usual definition. And therefore, there's really no reason to think of this thing as anything but a sheaf. That is sort of an aside. OK, now, with that aside and out of the way, now let's do some things with this. If I wanted a cross section of my bundle of wheat, what I do is I make a slice through it, picking out all the neighboring elements. Well, how do I get from one neighboring element to the next? One neighboring stalk to the next. How do I do it? No, it's not no chain maps. It's all of whatever, what's up for it. Just hop from one stalk to the next along the linear map that is there. Yeah, really simple. And <clears throat> Really, if I select an element out of each of these, so a section, or a cross, a cross section of a section is the usual term, it is merely picking out a vector out of every one of these spaces so that when I walk along the appropriate linear maps, I get that what was already there. So section. Tau, 
typing of this is a little bit weird, but it's all right. It satisfies this kind of equation. So let me, let me unpack this. Sigma and tau are simplices. One being a subset of the other means that all the vertices in this one are in this one as well. So sigma is a face of tau. One is a face of the other. You can see that in the diagram. D is, could be your sigma, D is a face of AD. AD is a face of ABD. So this could be a sigma, this could be a tau in this specification. Now, it could not be the other way, however. This is not a face of this one. It's directional. Yeah? But S of D is also... Right, all right, all right. So now, now, now let's unpack this. Right. So now, I've got each of these. These are the stalks. These are the stalks, the vector spaces that are there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take up all of the stalks and I'm going to product them together, make one big order tuple, one big tuple that I can index into the slots of that tuple by the synthesis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one big Hagen vector space where, where all of the slots in that vector space are noted by these various spaces. And if I want to find the BD slot, I go grab it out of this one. If I want to find the A slot, I grab it out of this one. So S, being such a vector, has a bunch of different slots. So this, this thing here, this is an element of S of tau. This is an element of S of sigma. Now, all that leaves us now is with this thing. So what is that thing? Well, there's really only one other thing it could be in the diagram, because I'm asking for something in S of tau, the higher dimensional thing, getting matched up with S of sigma, something in the lower dimensional thing, the stalk. Well, there's only one way it could have gotten from here, this space, to this space, following along one of these arrows. This is that arrow. Now that gets a special name. This is one of those linear functions. And this is called a restriction. So in this diagram, this arrow is S, D, arrow, A, D. Showing you going from D to A, D. That's this particular map. And of course, every other arrow in this diagram can be so labeled. Of course, if we paint the neck to write them all out. But you can do it. And the, that is the map that's played here. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this element of this vector space, S sigma. I'm pushing it through this linear map so it ends up here. And I'm comparing it with the data that's already this. If it, it is, in fact, equal. And every time I do this all over my entire diagram, then I call that a section. Yeah, questions? Uh, sigma is that you're taking the sigma yep. vector space? Yep. Uh, I've taken the sigma and the tau vector space. Yes. And then, okay, so it's really make uh, AX times. That's right. AX equals B, exactly. This is a linear map, a matrix, and this is a vector. Form that matrix vector product and compare it to this other vector. Okay, you got a question? Uh, yeah. So when we're, when we're taking a restriction, I typically think of restrictions as reducing dimension. You are stealing my next comment. Oh. <laughs> but yes, continue. Go ahead. Why is it called a restriction? Okay, all right. Hold that thought. I, I, I want to actually, this is, this is math. I want to actually show you an example where this does something. Cool. All right, next question, if any. All right, then let's do it. Uh, can you explain the S in the product 
of the, the, the she's? This what? guy? Yeah, no, the S and the L for that. That is a what? This is a vector. That's a vector. This is a vector. And what I've done is I've taken a bunch of vector spaces, yeah. and I've formed a bigger vector space by concatenating all the bases, yeah. making a huge vector space spanned by independently each of the various bases here. Oh, okay. So this is a big, huge yeah. vector. And now this is one of those big, long vectors. Yeah. So S is written as a function. Yeah, you could think of it as perhaps subscript. Mm. Would that help? I, I usually like to write it as a function because I think of it as a function on the simplices. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it as perhaps S subscript, as in it's the sigma th slot. Okay, but it would it would it would but, assume a vector value regardless of yes. which simplex you fed. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, because it's a, it's a Cartesian. It's a Cartesian product. product. That's that's what's throwing. Yep. Gotcha. It's a Cartesian product. Gotcha. Yep. What's a Cartesian product? This product. Yeah. So, so, Cartesian. Okay. so uh, this is a this is a tuple. Okay. It's a tuple with as many slots as I have simplices, okay. and they're yeah. indexed by the names of the simplices. So actually, Python wise, this is like a Python dictionary, yeah. and I'm and I'm indexing it by this key. Why couldn't it be a list? Those are two. Well, I, the point the point is that that, I, that I have a particular set of indices that I'd like to get into it with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can think of it as a list, but then it's on you to keep track of which slot is which. Mm -hmm. If it's keyed, then I just say, look up this key, go get it for me. Mm -hmm. The language takes on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And dictionaries are really and dictionaries are really fast, exactly. Now, disadvantage, dictionaries don't come pre-built with algebra built into them, but you could, you could build a type that does that. Yeah? Uh, I was going to ask if, so your key is sigma, mm -hmm. which is equivalent to one of these one D's, of these or D's or ADs or ADs. And, AD's and then them. your value is, is in that vector space that's a fancy right script S of yeah. that. Yep. I thought it was a basis. No. Okay. So you, said, so you form the, the Cartesian product of these vector spaces by concatenating the bases? Yep. Concatenating the bases and asserting that the bases from different stocks are linearly independent. How do you know that? No, you just assert that. You say, this is how I'm making it. Oh, okay. Sure. So I'm just, I'm just trying to conceptualize this with data. So. All right, well, let's, let, let me do that then. Oh, okay. Let me do that. That was my next point. Okay. So there, there's, there's several ways you think of this. So you think of this as actually, this is a, this is in some sense a specification of a database, yeah. like a tabular database, in which each of the simplices correspond to separate database, ta separate tables in your database. By tabular, do you mean relational? I mean a relational database, like with rows and columns. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> rows and columns. Now, we won't end up with a sheet of vector spaces, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, you can think of, of each one of these guys as being a table, and the sort of primary biggest tables are the ones associated with the vertices. This is table D, this is table A, this is table B, table C. Now, table AD pulls out just the columns that are common to table A and D, if there are any. This then, this restriction map, restricts your attention to just those columns. Now, what happens over here is that there is no columns in common between D, C, and B. While here, there are some columns in common. Here there's, here there's some column, common columns, here there are none. So you can think of this as, as, as being a specification of a relational database. And then the restriction maps are take the contents of this table, the contents of this table, and throw away all the data that is not in a column that database A has. That's what this restriction is. Mm -hmm. So each of the each of the table join each of the table I forget what it is, whether it's the, the join of the meet. I guess it's the table meets. So I'm, I'm taking the two tables and I'm let me write this out. So maybe do do a two table exam. Yeah, something like that. I, I, I'm, 
I, I don't, I'm not up on the terms. But yeah, I've never touched databases. Yeah. So, all right. So here's an example. Tabular database. So, so um, really, what we you could theoretically just start with a database, like yeah. one, and then break it apart in this way. Yes. And then you can have, um, and then and then you can conduct an analysis. Right. Uh, th think about it this way. This is part of the reason why this this is this is even current work now. Uh, suppose suppose that I've got these various databases or these various tables owned by various entities. I'm saying they can come from one database. Oh, sure. So you can start start to, yes, yes, you yeah. certainly can do that. Yeah. You can certainly take one database and slice it apart in this way. Uh, but you can also take it apart and, and say, you know, I have several different databases, and they don't all necessarily contain the same data, but I'd like to know similar data and, and how they fit together. This is a way to do that. So, for instance, this could be the database of, of records held by the registrar. These are databases held by the financial aid people, and this is the database held by admissions. And what would this diagram be called in that sense? Well, uh, this is a sheaf. Okay. I don't know. I, I mean, it, generally speaking, this is this is this is some data. This wouldn't just jump be called a database, I think. But it's a big relational database okay. that's been sliced apart into a bunch of tables. Mm, sure. When you when you have a relational database, you have a pile of tables, and you start messing about with them in various ways and forming queries to extract certain rows, i.e. certain elements out of the stalks. You wouldn't necessarily know what was a subset. Uh, you do by the fact that you know the keys. When you have a relational database, you have the rows, which are the various entries, but the columns are keyed. The columns say, you know, this column here is name, this column is student ID, this column is whatever. So what these are doing is these are operating on those keys. So, so let, let me make this happen. So let, let, me let me take this little portion right here. So let's set, let A be a table that looks like this. This has got name, and this has got address, and it's got phone number. got name, and this has got, uh, let's say, address, and this has got um, a mushroom. And to make this match up with my diagram here, I've got a table that's got address, got address, and it's got um, number and it's got zip code for and one more I suppose would could be C and it's going to have something in common with table B but not with any of the others and something that's in common with table D not with any so that constrains two of the columns for you. But I'm running out of room, so I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so now, this is specifying that the tables, the actual contents of the tables are the spaces, the, possible, the space of possible contents, the space of possible entries that I will permit in this table. So a given instance is not that. I mean the entire space of possible entries I can fill in this table. That's script S of A. The entire possible contents of this table, that's script S of B. The entire possible contents of this table, that's script S of D. So then, when I look at this particular map, it's going to do something. It's going to, what is it going to do? It's going to say, grab table D, and it's going to throw away anything that is not also present in table A, which means it's going to throw out the zip code. If I look at this map here, going from A to A to D, it's going to take this table and it's going to throw out anything that's not present in this table, which means 
it's going to throw out the name. Because the name is not present down here. So that's what we mean by restriction. We're restricting our attention to the space of possible table values that are present in common between these two tables. So you're restricting your domain your really function S? Uh, well, S, S, is not, S is not so much a function. S is a function is. between yeah, uh, so S and AD. Something yeah. like that, yeah. So you're, you're restricting the, the, the size of this particular space. Right. You're restricting the space of possible values down to a smaller space of possible values. Those that are somehow in common between these two. But you're operating column ones. But you're op operating column ones, yeah. exactly. Now, if you go down to A, B, D, that would restrict your attention from the space of possible values here in D down to the ones that are in common across all three, which is only address. So the only thing you'd retain is the address column. Now, what does a section look like? So what is a section? Well, it's a section is now an entry out of each of these that is consistent with this restricting operation. So one that's in all of them? It's got to, so it certainly has to agree on the ones that are in all of them. So what that means is now a section is a specification of a row out of each of these tables and out of all the subtables so that when I restrict down, cut away the various columns, everything matches up. So let me give you an example of what that might be. So you might have a name. You may have a bunch of names, a bunch of other names. And you might have a bunch of addresses. bunch of other addresses. A bunch of other addresses. This is why databases are done by computers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they weren't the old days. I know. <laughs> fair point, fair point. Um, what are the odds that you just randomly... <laughs> uh, oh, also, your age shouldn't be seven digits. <laughs> Unless, <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're really... really those, those, could be, those could be in days. Uh, could be, could be. Why would there be a hyphen in the middle? <laughs> Because you're subtracting. Oh, you're subtracting. Oh, you're subtracting. So you're negative. So that negative. means that the answer is negative. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. If I was in 18 years, minus 2,000. Okay. Days. Right. Yeah, so that's what you call it. So these are these are various possible entries that can be taken out of this. Now I did say vector space, so I'm imagining a vector space of names. That. How do I do that? Oh wait, I'm using MATLAB. Everything's a vector. Uh -oh. Not just being facetious, but. But the fact of the matter is you can think of that as, as being vector data or not. It really doesn't matter. So now you can ask, OK, these are some possible values that I can assign to each of these talks in my database. Are there any sections here? Do you see any sections? They show up. That's when you. That's when everything's going to match if up if you take, walk around. If you take B because it's a subset. Hmm? Mary. Yeah, Mary. So if I grab out this row from this column and this column, oops, yeah. watch me circle row up in here, and this column, or rather row, uh, notice if I take a look at what's between A and D, what's between A and D is address and phone number. They match. They match. Between here, what's this address and name? They match. And here. Just address, they match also. 
So that's an indication then that, that this choosing of this particular row out of each of these various tables and all of their requisite subtables match. Now, let's ask the question, when I've done this join, have I learned anything? Well, from the outset, I did not necessarily know what Mary's age was if I'm looking just at table A. But I now know that Mary's age is 23, and I also now know her zip code. So by pulling this data together in this way, I'm able to make some inferences that I couldn't make before. Now, of course, there are risks. Can we infer that Mike and Bob are some kind of domestic partnership? Perhaps. Housemates? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they have different zip codes, so they might just... They, they may have different zip codes, but from this information, that's all we know. Yes. I, I must admit, I, I have been the victim of this sort of thing happening. Uh, Michael Robinson is a frightfully common name, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and presumably at some point there was a Michael Robinson who did something to get him on a no-fly list. Uh -oh. <laughs> this resulted in a in section inference problem for me when I tried to trap <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Did you, did you try to explain that to the DSA in terms of math? This, this, was, this was something that, that would be a good way to get him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You are doomed. You are doomed. You'll never fight again. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there were. Yeah, I, I, I had to make use of some Bayesian updates to figure out what was going on. I'll just put it that way. I had to update my prior a bunch of times to realize what was going on. Anyway. Okay, so we can form sections. Now, forming sections is the sort of thing one wants to do with database when you put them together. Now you can ask, is there a way that I can systematically, rather than just sort of looking at the data until it jumps out at you, is there a systematic way to do this? Probably. And the answer is yes. The whole point is this homological algebra machine that we've built can do it also. How does it do that? That's kind of, kind of crazy. Well, the way, that, the way that it works, if you look at, Look at, if I'm assigning data to the biggest tables I've got, the vertices, the places where I need to check for consistency are amongst those vertices and between those vertices. I need to check my biggest tables one against the other. And of course, here, I need to check uh, amongst the vertices and edges. Is that true for all? Yes! Why? Because I asserted this diagram is commutative. Yeah. Yeah. So, you don't, so you don't actually care what happens once you... What happens downstream it just comes happens. out on the wash. Yeah, okay. If they were consistent on the level that I've marked, then they will be consistent. Okay. And have you change. identified these things which you have circled? I have I, what I have done is I picked a vertex and a vertex that are endpoints of the same edge. Right. So what, what needs to happen, if I have a section, is that this ver the, the value at this particular stalk needs to match up with the value of this particular stalk when I move them together along their respective restrictions onto this stalk over this edge. And that has to happen everywhere. If that happens everywhere, then I've got a section. So the sections are determined uniquely by their values on the vertices. So if you know what's going on on the vertices, you know everything else. You can figure that out by a little bit of homological algebra. And the reason for that is because you built a chain complex. So the tactic, build a chain complex. Tactic for identifying sections. Yep. Yes, for computing all sections at once. Mm. So you build a chain complex and examine And the key theorem is that you actually, it's in the zeroth level homology. Zeroth degree tells you all the sections. Now, what's kind of cool is that there are other homology classes, other homology spaces, that tell you about other sorts of weird things that 
Essentially what it says is it says if I only have access to some tables, I can't see the whole table, I can get fooled. If I only saw the subtables in this problem, I might end up thinking that things are getting fit together, but I don't have the full picture. And therefore, I might be making inferences that are wrong. Why is this important? Well, as noted, um, this was me on the no-fly list. <laughs> well, I was on the list that could be the no-fly list, and there's a no-fly column. And it wasn't shown properly. It wasn't even present. You could draw the wrong inference. What you is that called? Troll. <laughs> it's called troll. It's called waiting a lot in the airport. Ah, uh, th those, okay, th those are what the other homology spaces tell you. Because they tell you ways that if you make inferences purely from subtables rather than from the big tables, how you can get fooled. So, so, this, so computing the homology will allow you to connect data sets that would seemingly be unlinkable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you will, this is emergent properties of databases. Yeah. That's right. Good. Yep. And this, 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 is, this is why this has become an active area of research, because now we've got lots of tables out there, lots of databases. We're putting them together trying to draw inferences. Yeah, I was going to ask, so databases are your main input? Or? Databases are your main input, but these tables, yes. Now, as various of my students will also probably tell you if you ask them, there are lots of other things you can put instead of database data. You can put various kinds of predictive variables, and then these restriction functions could be the process of running a simulation. And then this whole thing is running some uber simulation. In fact, that's how we solve partial differential equations. We solve partial differential equations numerically by building out the base space, as in this big simplicial complex. Literally, I actually spent time when I was in high school writing these measures. Uh, basically, you take a big volume, you slice it up into a simplicial complex, and pass that around and solve differential equations on it. The values of the differential equations and their derivatives lie in the stocks. Huh. Can you do this with graphs? You certainly can do this with graphs. In fact, this is this is a prop. This is the proper generalization of most of the graph theory that people do. Hmm. Absolutely. You should try this on AU's uh, course. What do they call it? Yeah. The, the, the course map. Well, that, that course map was that, that was something my wife and I put together. Right, that yep. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did that. <laughs> we did that. Oh, we, you're, you're absolutely right. You can start tearing that apart. Look at, in fact, one thing that might be fun is to look at, you know, okay, what, what's sitting over each of these things is a space of texts, and asking how different courses, their course descriptions are related to one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Anyway. That, that probably only finds out that academics are very parochial. Uh, probably not very useful a piece of information. Can, can you use similar um, tactics yes. for like if you have two data sets that are seemingly unlinkable? Yeah. Like oh. having, so, okay. Yes, that's sort of the point. That's sort of the point. Right. No, I mean, I'm saying that like in this Oh, way, I see. That for you instance, don't know like, how they Yeah, so like for instance, I have one that has like the, like the firm's name, and then I have one that has like, digit numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm trying to, I have to have this di you know, dictionary that says, oh, and this firm name is associated with this number, but they're not exactly lined up with the you know, exact letter sequences. Uh, or, I mean, or is it just That like, becomes a bit more tricky. Okay. That becomes a bit more tricky. Or is it, you're, you're concerned about if basically the names are spelled differently? Right. I'm, I mean, I'm talking so, about linking two data sets all right. just by group. So terms. remember, we, is there remember we built simplicial maps? Yeah. You can do a simplicial map here, dragging along the stalks. Those are called sheaf morphisms. And they can drag the data around. What you might do in your case is actually collapse, say, all of these are various ways that might be different spellings. I'm going to collapse them together and see what new inferences I can make if I try to block them together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many, many possibilities. But I, I don't want to get too wrapped around the axle because in the last 15 minutes, I want to show you how to do this. OK, so here's the idea. The chain complex is going to go the opposite direction that, that we've gone in dimension. So before, if you remember, before, we went C2 down to C1, down to C0, down to 0, and there's lots more stuff here. These are vector spaces spanned by the simplices. This is simplicial homology, like a simplicial chain complex. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do 
basically the same thing in reverse. We're going to start out with the vertices and go up in dimension. Why? Well, look at the way my arrows kind of go in my diagram to begin with. They go up in dimension. No sense in fighting against the arrows. Let's follow the arrows. And to indicate that, instead of writing the degree as a subscript, I'm going to write it as a superscript to remind you that it's going the other way. Again, each of these are vector spaces. But these are vector spaces built up from the stalks. Each C is a vector space. So I'm going to do, we'll leave this diagram here. I'm going to write down a formula for what those stalks are. Uh, what the vector spaces are in terms of the stalks. Now it turns out there's actually quite a few different possibilities, po different options for how you can build this kind of chain complex. This is going to be called a co-chain complex. The co indicating that you're going the opposite direction than you were before. In some sense, actually, co-chain complexes are more fundamental uh, than chain complexes, but nevertheless, and for that reason, that's why I get confused and write down, say, at the beginning of the semester, we kept writing down co-chain complexes, because this is a little more natural in my mind. But anyway, uh, what you do is you say, well, the many possibilities, the easiest one is the simplicial co-chain complex. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, this used to be all of the zero simplices. Why don't I come over to my diagram and just grab all of, oops, all of the zero dimensional stalks, the stalks over the zero dimensional surfaces, and stick them together. So in the end, CK, and I can tag it of S, to remind you it's of S, but to find it to be the product, sigma is a K simplex. And like I did for sections where I did everything, I'm just now going to do just these K synthesis. So I'm going to take all of the stalks over the K synthesis and stick them all together, form one big vector space for all the K synthesis. So this is all the stalks over the vertices, this is the stalks over the edges, the stalks over the two cells, etc. Okay? Now I need my boundary maps, although now at this point they're going the other way, perhaps I'll call them co-boundary maps. So dk is going to go from ck to ck plus 1. It's going to have a formula. That formula is basically going to look like the formula we had before. Except, of course, that everything's going to go the other way. Uh, but that's not, that's not really a problem. Because I have these restriction maps working for me. Those restriction maps are going to take me the right way. Now, I could write this out in the same exact formula that we did before, and I'll do that. And then you could also write it out, since this is a Cartesian product of vector spaces, you could also write it out as a block matrix. A block matrix is kind of nice, too. So let me write it out both ways. Let me take dk and let me act on a particular element of this, cochain here. Cochain here, it's like before, it's a vector, it's also a function. It's a vector formed of concatenating the bases of the various k synthesis. So this dk of c, c is an element of this space, it's going to be, when I'm done with it, something that's going to be able to take in all the k plus 1 synthesis. So what I should be able to do is I should be able to give you a k plus 1 simplex and ask what is the value of this new object, this new vector, what is the value in the slot associated to a k plus 1 simplex? Okay, well which k plus 1 simplex? Well, let's say this one, 0 up to vk. What's the value of this on this k simplex? Well, it's going to look exactly formulaically like what we had before, of course. Minus 1 to the i, just as before. And now, rather than just being throw out the kth or the i-th vertex, 
Well, that i vertex, if I throw it out, I'm going to be down a dimension, which is what I want, but I need to push it forward with that restriction map. So I need that restriction map, and that restriction map is going to go from the i, ditch the vi, to vk. That restriction map is going to now go up to vk, and then I'm going to apply it to that particular element. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty heinous formula, just because it's a lot of notation. Much nicer to write it out of the block form. Sorry, what is small c? Small c is an element of this space. It is a vector in this space. So it's, a, it's one of these Python dictionaries indexed by the k, k simplex. So this thing takes as input k simplices and produces as output an element in the stalk over that k simplex. I need to give you something that's going to output something that now is going to be a new dictionary indexed by k plus 1 simplices, outputting something in that sum of various k plus 1 simplices. So, here, here is a k plus 1 simplex. What is its value? I now define it for you by this formula. Okay. So it's, it's, like a, uh, it's like a tuple, except the yes. indices are actually vectors. Yes, precisely. Okay. It's a dictionary, in fact. Yeah. So now, now let me go over here. Really, this is a negative 1 to the i in this block. It's now this kind of restriction map, sigma i to tau j in that block. This is the ith, this is now the ith k simplex, and this is the j, this is the jth k plus 1. So it's really just organizing into this block diagram. another way to represent this particular map. Now, for exactly the same reason as was the boundary, the simplicial boundary map was, in fact, giving rise to a chain complex, the same is true here. Why? Because if I delete two of these guys here, delete an i and a j out of this list, an i and a j out of this list, I'm going to pick out an excess minus sign and they're going to cancel out. Same argument as so this is still chain complex. What does that mean? That means then that if I'm coming in from this side, I follow my restriction map along a plus, and maybe this one I follow it on a minus. Uh, did I get that wrong? Uh, no, this one follow it, uh, I get a minus, this one I get a plus. What is that saying? That's saying that the elements of the zeroth cohomology, the elements of the zeroth cohomology consist of elements specified in here and in here, such that when I push them forward along this one, backward along this one, subtract them, I get zero. Which is to say, it's a section. That's the construction. So this notion computes the sections all at once by asking for the kernel of this map. But it gives you a lot more. These are telling you what happens if I start inferring along the subtables along the edges. Take all the subtables on the edges. Try to draw inferences from them. How can I get fooled? What new information has been brought into you that wasn't present before? What spurious sections am I going to believe are there, which are not? Yeah. Is C the rule of S we had in that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. C is, C is, you can think of C as a candidate for a section. It's not necessarily a section, but it's a candidate for a section. Has, has this been applied to networks at all? What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, from from like a from a base data set though, not from not from multiple ones. So yes. you, you split. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Does, okay. yes. I, I, I have a number of active projects doing just that. I see. Okay. This is this is, this forms the main line of my active research. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so right here you've got a sheaf. Uh, script S. Yep. 
Uh, oh, sorry. Well, one line down from there on the right. Yeah. This thing is the restriction map, the arrow in that diagram. Okay, so that, that's a restriction map. Right, so this is taking this particular guy, which lives in here, and mapping it into something in here. Okay. Um, so if it wasn't going to give me a headache, which it would, uh, but it, if it wasn't, then we'd put parentheses around that small scene. Yes, right. The way I had, had it before was I had an extra set of parentheses there, and then yes, you could add another set of parentheses there. Yeah, so that would give me a headache. But I Sorry, that's why I didn't do it. Yeah. Well done, you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is this is amenable to a lot of parentheses. I, 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 you're not the first person to complain about excess parentheses in this theory. So it is. Some people try to push these into subscripts and superscripts, and then I forget which is which, and I get super confused. <laughs> So that, that's why I kind of, this is, this is more verbose, but at least it's clear. Uh, As opposed to, oh, this is a superscript, that's a superscript, or which one's which, I don't know. And then typesetting is a real pain, this is just easier. Okay, now, so the question then is, all right, so let me write down the key theorem. The key theorem is, if you do this, you build that thing, first of all, it is a chain function. That's the, yeah, that's the first sort of mathematical observation here, so theorem. Is a chain complex. So that's the first thing. The second thing is HK of S, which I'll define to be, well, just the homology of that chain complex, Beware the indices, they're down rather than up. This is the kth sheet cohomology. H0 is isomorphic to the space of, of sections. So all of the global inferences that you can make. H0. So this, of course, can be computed. This is just the kernel of D0. So that says you can find the kernel of D0. You have computed the space of functions just by linear algebra. And this, this guy here, this is the, the quote, new sections new purported sections on a present as global sections when using only subtables. In particular, only pairwise subtables. There's H2, H3 on all the way up the chain about the kind of new spurious sections that are things that you think would be sections that aren't, but you'd think would be sections if you just use those subtables rather than the whole tables. So these are, if you will, these are faulty inferences that could be made. Does it say not present as not global? present as global sections up here, the whole thing, when you're only using subtables mm -hmm. over the edges. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very good for describing what happens when you don't have a full story. In fact, a favorite example of ours, as in that my, my collaborators and I, uh, is, is to write down um, some kind of situation like a game of telephone, where, you, where one person talks to the next, who talks to the next, who talks to the next, finally coming back to the first person. If you only look at the messages being transmitted along the line, you can get very confused, because you won't actually hear the original message that's made around as it gets corrupted. And that shows up as a generator in each one, an element of each one. Yeah. So uh, suppose I'm like a database administrator. Yeah. And I've got access to A, B, C, and D, but I can't give everybody access to A, right. B, and C, and D. I can only give various subtables. Yes. So say I give Evan A and B. Yep. Now, if I give him access to this cohomology, yep. I can tell him 
be, I, can, I, can, I can keep him from making the mistakes yes. without giving him access to sensitive information. In some sense, yes. There, 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 there's a little bit of complexity there. But yes, that's basically the idea. Because the, what's the complexity? You now know what the complexity is. It's the fact that, remember, this is specified as a quotient space. It's not in terms of the original data. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can caution him that, oh, this particular set, this particular thing that you're looking at, I, Evan comes back to you and says, I, I want to make an inference with these various entries out of the database. Mm -hmm. Should I feel confident in doing that? Mm -hmm. You can ask yourself, is that representative of this element of H1? If it's non-trivial there, then you can say, look, you better be careful. That you're likely to make an error there. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can, make, you can make some kind of security implications there. So why do you say likely as opposed to, I would think if I have access to all the data bases, I yes. have to be able okay. to say If you have access to, to the entire database, mm -hmm. then yes, you can go, then you can clearly tell him whether or not it's a, a section or not. But then, is it now, but then he can run an attack by asking you many queries to figure out what's el what else is in your database. Uh, yeah, so that's what I was afraid of. Yes. So by giving him only access to these, you've, you've given him strictly less information. He can't recover everything that way. Uh, but if I give him, if I give him only this H one, yes, then then and he, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily have as many guarantees about the performance of his inference. Uh, so there, there, there are pluses minuses. But but on the other hand, I mean, this in some sense now what I've not said is is this theory is actually foundational, which is to say you can build all the mathematics on this. And if you write down a bunch of axioms about what you would like a multi-table relational database to have, what kind of performance you would like it to have, you end up exactly recovering the structure. In fact, that's, that is the content of my second most recent uh, preprint that's up on the archive. It explains how to do that and it, and it talks about the kind of inferential faults you can make if, if these guys are present. I don't think of it, I don't explain it directly as databases. Well, actually, no, I take that back. I do actually explain it in terms of databases. Uh, so that, that's, that's in there. So this gives you a nice, uniform way to talk about database inference. These don't have to be tabled. These don't have to be tables. There could be other things, too. Other kinds of sensors and information sources. And I think that's a good place to stop. So thank you for listening. <laughs>